Okay, so culture bias within psychology issues and debates on paper three. Now, this is something that you've been looking at all the way through the course. But in this section, you need to understand it in a very logical and systematic way. So let's get started. So now let's look at some three key terms which, which you need to learn just as they are, because these could conceivably be two markers or even multi-choice. So the actual term culture bias is just a tendency to ignore cultural differences. So in other words, all behaviour is interpreted through the lens of your own culture. That behaviour is wrong, that behaviour is right, is all judged through our own experiences or our own culture. It tends to happen all the time. Why does that happen? Because we don't even realise that we're being culturally biased. People just don't realise it. Because from a very early age, we have been permeated. All of our life is subtly permeated by these cultural differences. And we don't even notice they're happening. We just think of it as being the norm. Ethnocentrism means that you actually make a judgment about normative behaviour and standards, okay, by those of your own culture. So this can lead to a lot of prejudice and even discrimination towards other cultures. A good example would be how, you know, what you do to greet somebody that you've never met before. So in the UK, in Europe in the UK, we tend to greet somebody with like a handshake, but on the continent, let's say, in France, that would be very formal and, and actually rude. You would need to kiss them on both cheeks, not just on one cheek. And that would be the norm. OK, so if somebody comes over here and acts in a way that they would do in France, we might think that's, you know, funny or strange or discriminate against it. And the same in France. So the idea is that we all have set ideas of what is normative behaviour and we tend to judge other cultures by our norms and that is ethnocentrism. And cultural relativism means that these norms that we've got in our culture and you'll have met this term many times in social psychology on paper one, that many behaviours and many norms are absolutely specific to that particular culture. And we really need to understand them as having developed within one particular culture. OK, so now let's move on to like apply these for AO1 marks. OK, so universality and bias. When we look back in 1992, 64%, that, sh that should say, of the world's psychology researchers, sorry for the typo, were American. So psychology is aiming to study all human behaviour and is making claims for universality. But 64% of psychology researchers are from the U US of A. And they probably still are. OK, so it is a mistake to believe that the findings and conclusions of theories in studies can be applied all over the world. Is that a fact? Or can we apply them? That's a big argument. E.g. Solomon Ash, Stanley Milgram first carried out their famous studies in social psychology and they were in America but they were subsequently replicated all over the world. And therefore, we found that there was a lot of variations in those findings. So if behaviour is judged from the standpoint of only one culture, then the findings that deviate might be thought to be abnormal. So what we're arguing is that, you know, Stanley Milgram's obedience studies let's just look at him, were done all over the world, but he started in the USA. And if they'd never gone anywhere else in the world, then you could have said, well, that's a cultural bias. But actually they did go all over the world and there were many different findings, okay? 
But if you take the view that the American standard is the only standard, the baseline findings of Milgram that 66% obeyed, then the other ones were would be abnormal. Okay, we would say they are, you know, they are abnormal. It's a bit hard to get your head around this. We are not saying those were abnormal findings, but if we took a cultural bias point of view, then we would. But actually, Milgram wanted all of his experiments to be replicated all over the world. A good example of it being vastly different was a 1970s study where they did where they can easily replicate Milgram because it's a very easy lab experiment to replicate. And so it was replicated in the 1970s in Australia and the findings were very strange. Only a very small proportion of people obeyed and went all the way to kill the person, apparently to kill the person in the other room with the electric shocks, with the fake electric shocks. And who were in these studies? Women. So it was very, very interesting that women in 1970s Australia were far from obedient in that sort of situation, that lab experiment and with all those situational variables in place. But no one is saying they are abnormal or deviant, but you might, if you did have a bias, want to come to the conclusion that there's something wrong with Australian women. Okay? That is, if you take Milgram's original findings in the USA to be the standard. And of course, that, you know, that, that would also be bringing a gender bias into it, okay? But, you know, if you look at Milgram's variations all over the world, you will find that there are subtle variations according to different cultures, and we can explain them. Another good study to look at would be Mary Ainsworth's strange situation here, a very, very good one to look at, because there were very clear cultural differences in those, you know, results. So once again, we've got a standard lab experiment that will be replicated exactly. And still, there will be far different results in different cultures. So you can use that data um, as well. And you could have a bias against the culture if you took Mary Ainsworth's first findings as the standard, okay, because of the you know, sort of USA as being the original findings, so 66% secure and so on. Second point, ethnocentrism. Now, this is a particular form of culture bias where you believe in the superiority, the superiority, sorry, of your cultural norms, that you have the right norms. Your normative behaviour is correct and everybody else's is not. So again, you can bring Mary Ainsworth in here. For example, in the strange situation, she identified that you know secure attachment was you know was a desirable one. So when the babies were were really upset when the mum you know you know left the room, but they were easily comforted and easily settling into her when she came back and easily settled down to play again. That was secure behaviour. But there are many other cultures where secure was not the norm um, as much, e.g. Germany, where there were more avoidant children. And so this might mean that you end up labelling the German parents as being cold and uncaring. But that's a cultural bias. Just because the kids are like avoidant, it doesn't mean they were necessarily cold and uncaring. It just might mean that they got a different way of bringing up their kids according to their culture. So we must not think that our culture, our way is superior because that would be ethnocentrism. Finally, relativism. Okay, so cultural relativism would be, and, you know, sort of, once again, Mary Ainsworth is a very good example of this. If we impose the this theory from America as being correct, so actually, there's a researcher in 1969 
who argues that psychology has often done this. We make up many theories of, you know, attachment, social influence, all sorts of theories that come out of psychology very often are coming out of the UK or Europe sometimes, but mostly the UK and America and, you know, some European countries too. And we are often very guilty of an imposed ethic. Right, in other words, we are imposing on other cultures these be these sort of behaviours and normative behaviours that we have in our culture. And we shouldn't be doing that. And he argues, therefore, that all, all psychology and all psychologists need to be much more mindful of this issue and try to accept that different cultures have their own psychology. And therefore, really, there is a new movement within psychology arguing for every culture should have their own psychology. There shouldn't just be one psychology for the whole of the planet. There should be Chinese psychology, Iranian psychology, psychology from Iceland, psychology from Greece, psychology from Scotland even, psychology from Ireland that may be different to psychology from England. It can become very narrow. OK, but that's the idea that we shouldn't impose our, you know, normative behaviours that we find in our research, in our culture, and say all human beings should act that way. Okay, well that's the AO1, now some AO3 points. Okay, so three very easy AO3 points which you can expand on with lots of examples. Okay, individualism versus collectivism. You need to understand what an individualistic culture is and what a collectivist culture is. Individualism is mostly in the West and non-Western cultures, which may not always be in the East, by the way, e.g. South America, have a completely different ethos and they are called collectivist. Now, in the Western or the individualistic culture, individual freedom is paramount. And in the non-Western cultures, that's not so. They are more concerned with the family values and the, and the actual values of that culture as being paramount. And if you deviate from them in any way, that is not encouraged. It might even be punished. OK, so but here's the point. You know, can we make that very clear distinction anymore between individualism versus collectivism, between Western and non-Western cultures? Well, we can't. Why? Because we live in a world of the Internet. We now live in a world of global communication. And there is evidence that this very simple distinction may be slowly wearing down. I wouldn't say by any means completely wearing down in any way, but slowly wearing down. Here's an example, okay, looking at Japan versus the USA, it was found that 14 out of 15 studies gave no evidence of this traditional distinction, okay, that there was no difference in, in the actual behaviour that would be due to a very distinct cultural difference. Number two point, cultural relativism versus universality. We cannot by any means rule out that universality of behaviours that do transcend cultures. There are many, many um, times within psychology that we have found this, e.g. facial expressions for emotions. Very often they are the same all over the world and even in the animal world within species of course. So when we look at expressions for shock or happiness or joy or surprise it doesn't matter where you're brought up, what your culture you know, whatever's going on in your world around you, in that environment, these expressions seem to be universal, okay? So there's a very good evidence for universality, that is, in expressions, particularly in falling in love. 
Falling in love, by the way, is not a facial expression. What I'm saying is a falling in love is something which is universal. People say they fall in love. They can express that as a certain way of behaving that is completely different to just loving a person. Okay, so if you're doing, you know, relationships, you may have studied this. So when people talk about falling in love, they mean having an almost obsessive desire for somebody. And that, and, you know, and that is not only in the West, that's in the non-Western cultures, even where it might not be desirable. You need to write this down and make a few notes, okay? So even where it might not be desirable to fall in love because the culture might say, no, we just want to have arranged marriages. But nonetheless, even where it might not be desirable, people do it. They can't help it. They fall in love. So these things, okay, uh, falling in love, and facial expressions are actually driven by our biology. Very often, biology transcends cultural factors and becomes universal. Final point is, of course, demand. Is a cultural, uh, you know, distinction or a bias more evidence where we have a... Uh, psychology going on so where we have psychology going on and this is mostly in the west of course there seem to be more demand characteristics so this means that you know when you go all over the world to do research it's not so much now but it was certainly the case in the 1950s and 60s when people didn't know anything about psychology research and so on we you know, we really tend to find the people who go into lab experiments in the West understand what psychology is, even if they don't know what they're looking at in that study. And therefore, they are prone to have demand. They want to look good. They want to look like they're not crazy, basically. But that, that's a baseline, OK? So people know what psychologists is. They know what psychologists are. And they know that their behaviour in the lab is going to be judged. Whereas other people who don't know what psychology is, they may be more natural. So therefore, demand may have a cultural bias. There may be more demand in the lab in the West. OK, so there we go. There you have enough for a 60 more answer or for anything else they can throw at you. OK, good luck with that.